It's hard to believe, but there's only one more week before the first day of school, and I know everyone is busy with final preparations. Each new school year brings fresh opportunities, and I know each board member is looking forward to seeing all the accomplishments of our students and staff. As a school division, we remain committed to providing meaningful <coughs> learning experiences to support student success. Now let me read our newly adopted mission statement. The mission of York County School Division is to ensure every student is valued, supported, and challenged through learning experiences which prepare them for a successful future. Next, I will share some information about our pledge leader, Mackenzie Mitchell. Mackenzie is a fifth grader at Coventry Elementary. Coventry Elementary School is proud to have Mackenzie Mitchell represent our school as the pledge leader this evening. Mackenzie has attended Coventry since kindergarten and she currently serves as a Coventry ambassador. She's a great representation of the traits we want our Coventry Cougars to display. Mackenzie embodies our positive behavior expectations of practicing safety, acting responsibly, working hard, and showing respect. She is an honor roll student and is kind to all of her peers and teachers. Outside of school, Mackenzie loves cooking, playing video games, and playing with her friends. She is independent, not, not afraid to speak her mind, and she cares about others. Mackenzie is a wonderful role model for her peers. We know she will continue to make a positive impact in her final year as a Coventry Cougar. Please stand as Mackenzie leads us in our pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great job, Mackenzie. <laughs> uh, next, we're going to move into recognitions and awards. Um, and the first, we have introduction of our new staff. Dr. Carroll. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. I want to introduce and share a few comments about uh, relating to the newest additions to our YCSD leadership team. Uh, when I uh, say your name, please stand and remain standing. So first, we'll start with Ms. Tawanda Shirley. She's Associate Director of Student Services. Ms. Shirley has over 20 years of experience in education, from the classroom to district level, most recently as a district level special education administrator in Chesapeake. Next, Ms. Lisa Jalamo, Coventry Elementary School principal. Ms. Jalamo began her career in education as a second grade teacher at Mount Vernon Elementary School in 2005. Since 2016, she has served as an assistant principal at Seaford Elementary and Coventry Elementary. Dr. Lindsay Kidd, the new principal at Dare Elementary. Dr. Kidd began her career as a teacher in Newport News Public Schools where she took on multiple leader, school leadership roles. Since 2018, Lindsay has served as the assistant principal at Saunders Elementary School. Welcome. Next we have Ms. Jennifer Humble, Grafton Bethel Elementary School principal. Ms. Humble has more than 19 years of experience in education, having served as a kindergarten, second, and third grade teacher, assistant principal, and principal in Hampton City Schools. Ms. Beth, Beth Welch, Tab Elementary School principal. Ms. Welch has served as an assistant principal in YCSD since 2013, serving at Magruder, Waller Mill, and Seaford Elementary Schools. Prior to that, she taught in Hampton City Schools. Next, we have Ms. Amore Michael, <coughs> principal of Tab Middle School. Before joining the York County School Division, Ms. Michael served as a special education teacher, lead teacher, assistant principal, and principal in Newport News Public Schools and Williamsburg James City County Public Schools. Next, we have Ms. Candace Welch, who is now the principal at Queens Lake Middle School. Ms. Welch came to YCSD in 2016 as an assistant principal at Tab High School. Before that, she served as a secondary math and English teacher, lead teacher, math coach, and specialist in the Richmond area. All right, why don't we give them a, a round of applause? Yeah. And we'll let them sit down. We'll move on to the second row. <laughs> All right, Mr. Brian Fries is now the principal at Yorktown Middle School. Mr. Fries has served as the Coventry Elementary School principal since 2019, and before joining YCSD, 
Brian served as an assistant principal at Hines and Dozier Middle Schools with Newport News Schools. <clears throat> Next we have Ms. Mary Lugo, now the principal at Tab High School. Uh, Ms. Lugo has been with uh, our division for more than 25 years, serving in multiple leadership roles. Most recently, she served as the Tab Elementary School Principal. Next, we have Ms. Lindsay Kurtz. She's the Assistant Principal at Dare Elementary School. Ms. Kurtz joined us in 2014 and since has served as an ACI at Bethel Manor and Coventry Elementary Schools. She was promoted to assistant principal of Durham Elementary School this past February. <clears throat> Dr. Leah Harrell, she's the new assistant principal at Magruder Elementary School. Dr. Harrell served as an assistant principal at Stonehouse Elementary School. She also served as an elementary school teacher in Fauquier County and Williamsburg James City County Schools. Ms. Sherry Vandegrift. She's the new assistant principal at Seaford Elementary School. Ms. Vandegrift began her career in Newport News Schools and also has served as a middle school teacher and reading specialist in WJCC. Since 2020, she has served as the ACI ACC at Grafton Bethel Elementary School. Ms. Bree McCarthy is the assistant principal now at Tab Elementary School. Ms. McCarthy is taught in Washington Texas and Alaska. She joined YCSD in 2020 as a middle school special education teacher before becoming the assessment and compliance coordinator at Tab Middle School in 2021. Next we have Mr. Steve Legowich, Waller Mill Elementary School assistant principal. Mr. Legowich comes to us from WJCC where he served as the coordinator of K-12 social studies and as an assistant principal at J. Blaine Blayton <laughs> Elementary School. <laughs> Thank you. He became an educator through the ODU Career Switcher Program. Congratulations. Uh, and why don't we give them a round of applause. <laughs> and we'll finish with our last two. Ms. Tara Firth is the Grafton High School Assistant Principal. Uh, Ms. Firth joins us from Suffolk Public Schools, where she served as an assistant principal at Nansamon River High School since 2016, and her classroom teaching experience includes multiple subject areas. And now we uh, finish with Ms. Maureen Patrice Powdar. <laughs> Maureen, I'm sorry. She's the assistant principal at Tab High School. Ms. Powdar has over 23 years of experience in education, having served as an assistant principal at the secondary level for the Department of Defense Education Activity Unit in Europe since 2014. Welcome to all of you. Thank you very much. We look forward to hearing all the amazing things you guys are gonna do for the division. Thank you so much. Next we have a Presentation, RRMM Architect Superintendent Scholarship. Dr. Carroll? Yes, ma'am. I'd like to ask Mr. Kenny Word, Business Development Manager for RRMM Architects, uh, to come to the podium, and he will share a few comments relating to a student scholarship. Absolutely. Thank you guys for uh, allowing me to impose upon your meeting for a few minutes this <laughs> evening. Uh, as he mentioned, Kenny Word, Business Development Manager with RRMM Architects. Every year on an annual basis, we recognize the superintendent of the year as well as the eight regional superintendents of the year. It's our way of giving back to the community as well as recognizing these great educators for all that they do for the students in their respective districts. So I'm traveling all over the state, right? And I'm giving, <laughs> I'm giving away money. How about that? That's a cool thing. But uh, we feel it's very, very, very well earned you know, by each winner. So the regional superintendent of the year this year is none other than Dr. Victor Shandor. Yeah. So, I, so I have this nice fake check that I'm gonna take a picture with, you know, and, 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 and the real check is in the mail to that very much deserving students um, institution of higher learning. Cool. Absolutely. So can I get a picture awesome. from someone? Yes, yes, yes. Go down front. Oh, sure. 
scooting, scooting in? Scoot in, guys. Scooting scooting in. In. Oh, we gotta we stand, to up. stand up. Yeah, uh, yeah please stand up. <laughs> there we go. Here's a hint. If you can't see us, we can't see you. There we go. Mr. Higginbotham. It's the best thing a photographer ever taught me. Thank you. <laughs> so that was short and sweet. Have a great evening. <laughs> <laughs>Dr. Uh, Dr. Carroll is going to stay down front because we're going to move into our York Foundation for Public Education. Mr. Schaefer. Yes. I'd like to invite Christina Head, York Foundation for Public Education board member, to step forward and assist Dr. Carroll as he presents a gift to our pledge leader, Mackenzie Mitchell, a fifth grade student from Coventry <laughs> Elementary School. Congratulations, Mackenzie, for re reciting the Pledge of Allegiance at tonight's school board meeting. A special gift from Cookie Text, an edible tweet, is being presented on behalf of the York Foundation for Public Education in partnership with their donor, Gene Fioca of Cookie Text, an edible tweet. A Walmart gift card is also being donated by a foundation supporter. Congratulations, Mackenzie. <laughs> You have to share that with your sister. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next we move into Accent on Academics. Dr. Carroll. All right, thank you. For this evening's Accent on Academics, Tab High School will share their experience competing against over 60 other teams at the 2022 National Kid Wind Challenge in San, San Antonio last spring during the American Clean Power Conference. Ms. Mary Lugo, TAB High School principal, will now provide additional detail and introduce tonight's presenters. Ms. Lugo. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. Good evening, board members. One of the things that's most exciting about this evening is I have an opportunity to present a transition program of sorts. Our Kidwin team at the high school level began at Mount Vernon Elementary with a couple of our team members when I was principal there several years ago. So it's exciting to see our team grow as they progress through elementary school, middle school, the high school level, and to achieve such an accomplishment as a national winner. So this evening, I'm very excited to share that Kyle Ray, Alice Fang, Jacoby Melton, Caitlin Wiltz, and Shugo Mori, along with their advisors, Mrs. Melanie White and Mrs. Stephanie Miller, are here this evening to tell you a little bit about their journey through the high school years, their journey to the national championship, and how they are going to secure a repeat this year. <laughs> so I turn it over to our team. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'll just briefly introduce us uh, just so you can like match a name to the face. So <laughs> this is Alice Fang, Kyle Ray, Shugo Mori. Jacoby Melton, and I'm Caitlin Wiltz, um, and we're gone with the wind. Uh, our name kind of came off of a whim, but <laughs> where we've been going is gone with the wind for past four, four years now. Yeah. Um, Alice, would you like to dive into stuff? <laughs> okay. So um, the majority of us have been working together as a team since eighth grade, however, Jacoby and I have been doing this, as Mrs. Lugo said, since fifth grade. So we started at the elementary school, at Mount Vernon Elementary School, um, as it was an after-school program. And one of the teachers, Mrs. Buckley, who's a fifth grade teacher, she presented this idea about um, wind team, which is essentially where we would compete to build wind turbines. Um, I can't speak for her, but I personally did it just because I thought the teacher was cool. And I thought it would be cool, and I wanted to be cool. So that's why I did it. But um, we started in fifth grade. And at the beginning, it was really just about building things, learning how to like use box cutters and uh, hot gluing things together. 
Um, we competed and we got seven jewels, I think, at our first competition. I think, I think so. Seven. Yeah. So um, we get like a couple hundred now, so it's not much in comparison. But at the time, we were all really excited about it because it was just a really cool thing to have the opportunity to be a part of. So um, luckily, Mrs. Buckley moved with us up to Tab Middle School. So we had the opportunity to continue at the middle school. So for sixth and seventh grade, we sort of continued in just a variety of teams. We would jump back and forth and we would use designs that we just sort of thought of on a whim. But then in eighth grade, we came together to sort of form this team. And I believe Kyle will talk more about how we've sort of evolved our blade design as our team. Hello. <laughs> so in middle school, um, I don't remember when our, one of the mentors we had joined us. His name is Dr. Stevenson, and he joined, well, I joined the team eighth grade. Do you guys remember when he, did he hop on eighth grade? Yeah, so eighth grade, he um, works at the, um, NASA Langley, and he started mentoring us, and when we started our team, we started to have a more logical approach to building our blades using the engineering design process. And so we went to him with questions like, is there a way we can calculate certain aspects of our blade rather than just throwing some stuff together and seeing what it does? So that, when, when we started doing that, that helped with designing our blades, having some system to say, okay, this helped with producing power. What else can we do? Or this didn't help, so we're going to not do that anymore. So yeah, that was like our approach to blades. And then in eighth grade, um, when we won our first national title, we wanted to continue in high school. So as freshmen, we started a gone, we started Kidwind, and we stayed as the same team, and we were able to start competing. And then two weeks before COVID hit, so yeah, that was that was interesting. So <laughs> that hit, and then we came back our sophomore years, and we were able to compete virtually. And we did go to nationals, and we won the presentation award, which was nice. So, yeah. Go ahead. So um, one of our uh, main idea or main goal for uh, as a team and for Kidwin is to promote renewable energy. Uh, we believe that renewable energy or like climate change is like one of our, our key issue in modern society. And by winning this national championship. We hope that we can promote uh, younger generations that's coming from middle school to join our club and to keep on promoting the renewable energy that we uh, started promoting. So, uh, yeah, if you want to say something about it. So, um, to add on to that, next year we actually are going to try to make our team a little bit bigger since it's just been us four or five for three years. So, we're going to try to pull in like freshmen, sophomores, maybe even juniors to start one or two more teams that we can mentor and then hopefully all of us can do really well and yeah so uh, we have a lot of people to thank for this journey but the biggest people we have are miss buckley for really like giving us the kickstart and then when we moved to high school and we wanted to keep going miss white and miss miller were really there for us because we were sometimes staying at the school until like 7 p.m or 8 p.m and they were just really willing to stay with us and take us to all of our competitions and really like fought for us to get to nationals this year so it was great um, additionally, we want to thank Daniel Tamager, who was a student mentor to us when, so when we started in fifth grade, he was there with us. When we were in sixth grade, he was there with us, seventh grade, eighth grade, and ninth grade until he um, graduated and went to college, so he couldn't be with us anymore. And then, um, as Kyle mentioned earlier, uh, Dr. Stevenson as well, since he's taught us a lot of the technical skills that we need, so like airfoils, Reynolds numbers, and that's really helped us and um, helped us in our blade design as well. And then finally, we want to thank um, the administrators at Tab High School and the school division for supporting us and allowing us to have such wonderful opportunities. We are now open to any questions that you may have. I was going to say that before we ask any questions, I was going to say, well done, guys. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Remarkable. Yep. So when you go to compete, uh, do you, is it a paper you write, a model you, you display, or drawings, or how do you 
how do you compete with the other other teams? Um, so there's like. <laughs> just be careful. Just be careful. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Wow. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, there's like multiple levels to each of uh, like the competition. So we got that from states, right? Yeah. States, and then yeah. that one f was from nationals, which is a bit funny because the bigger ones from the <laughs> smaller yeah. competition. But <laughs> yeah. um, and so for each level, I think the states was a little bit different. But um, we have a knowledge quiz, so they give us like a, a paper test on different aspects of renewable energy, um, wind energy, that sort <coughs> of thing, and then we have um, the instant challenge where they, we don't really know what it is beforehand. They kind of just like spring it on us. And they're like, okay, figure out this problem, figure out a solution, work it through. Yeah. And so we get scored based off of that. And then we get scored based off of how well our wind turbine does. So it's like multiple different things that we're wow. tested on that all get combined into our score. Wow, sounds yeah. very challenging. <laughs> yeah, it does. Great job. Now, are you are you going to stay in wind energy? Is that are you going to stay in the wind energy? I, I suspect there are different segments of focus. Yeah. Um. So for kid wind, don't they they have a solar? Yeah. They have a solar challenge. Yeah. But, um, sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> they have a solar challenge, but one thing with the solar challenge is um, that it stops at states. You can't like get to oh, the okay. national level to compete. <laughs> But we had expressed some interest in it, so I don't know. We don't have like a set plan yet. We're just gonna. Uh, <laughs> you know, I I do think too that the, your willingness to grow grow the pipeline and bring younger students on mm -hmm. your team Excellent. is very refreshing. Um, but to be together for so long yeah. is uh, quite That's remarkable, cool. and I'm sure you guys understand each other's strengths and perhaps. Room for improvement. Uh, <laughs> so that's that's great. It, it is. It's 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 remarkable. National championship, and particularly an endeavor like this. I know you're very proud. Of, we're all very proud of you. But um, yeah, that you were stay together this long. One more quick question. Hardest part of the design process is it all the prototypes? What what tools are you using? CAD tools? What kind of tools yeah. are you using? Um, yeah. So. When it comes to blades, originally, it was all hand done. It was, yeah. here's some toothpicks, here's some glue, here's a rod, let's <laughs> just build something. So originally, that's what we did. Um, eventually, we wanted to have a more reliable source of product producing our blades. So we started with um, 3D printing. We 3D printed airfoils to act mm -hmm. as the main frame for our blades. And then we went on to test laser cutting, or laser, yeah, laser cutting, I guess. So. We did that, we did that with wood, and so that was a big learning process. I remember like half of us being in a room just sitting there like, how do we get this machine to work? <laughs> sitting there, and then our, we have our teacher like, yeah, we don't know either, so we're just going through it. <laughs> so, but I mean, we learned a lot doing that, rather than just saying, okay, step one, step two. Doing that whole process forced us to learn a lot more than we would have otherwise by tinkering with it and whatnot. No, that's good. They, they shared with me. I visited briefly um, before the meeting, and the team shared with me. And I won't I won't name the the, the regional school division, but copied their <laughs> prototype um, oh. from states. So I thought that was uh, the ultimate compliment, right? <laughs> that they brought to nationals. But again, congratulations. Thank you. But I go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. I just think it's so neat that when you went to compete, it was against sixty other teams. But these weren't just 60 other teams. These were 60 of the best in the, in the country, correct? And you came out on top of everything. I mean, that was just awesome. That's great. Like, I wonder, like, with being together for so long, did you guys find yourself sort of falling into certain <laughs> roles? Was somebody better at research, someone better at the design or production or presentation? Go ahead. Alice. Um, so um, we sort of have, in some regards, for the most part, Kyle works with a lot of the software and like 3D modeling and that kind of stuff. Um, I think she also works a bit with software as well, especially when we're testing our blades. Um, I think we all sort of do research collectively. We all build our blades collectively because it isn't something that just one person can do. Um, I think 
Hugo and Caitlin work on the presentation a lot and making sure we sound put together, which is really important. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, we also spend a lot of time sort of because we're all so busy, because we're all high schoolers, it's a bit difficult. So these roles aren't like rigid. If someone's not there, we fill in just based off who is there and who can be where. And you're all still smiling and laughing <laughs> at each other too. That's I, I know for me, I, this is what it is all about. Everything you guys just said. I mean, this is why teachers do what they do. This is why principals do what they do. This is why every single person in this room does what they do. The fact that you found something you loved, you had a, a teacher that was supporting you, you loved it so much you went to the next level, and then when you got to high school it wasn't there, so you said, this is what we want, and people made it happen for you so that you can continue and do yeah. this, and I just think that's exactly why everybody does what they're doing. So first of all, I commend you, number one, for sticking with something, being so passionate about it when you come here, because you guys just did this presentation off the cuff, it looks like to us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we don't even do anything off the cuff up here. So, <laughs> but just, I mean, uh, so proud of you. And just thank you for representing York County School Division yes. well and your families well and your schools well. We're just really, yes. really proud of you. Congratulations. Thank you. All right, we are going to take a short recess so we can meet with our award recipient and our guests and take some photos, and then we'll be right back. Uh, we will now reconvene the meeting and move into our business portion. Uh, first, we have unfinished business. Uh, is there any unfinished business? All right, seeing none, we'll nope. move on to presentations. First, we have our American Rescue Plan, ESSER 3 grant update. Dr. Carroll. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Vika Stevenson, uh, the Division Grant Coordinator and Writer, will share an update on the American Rescue Plan, ESSER 3 grant. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Carroll. <laughs> this evening, I have the pleasure of providing an update on the York County School Division's American Rescue Plan Act, ESSER 3 plan. Please be advised that all changes presented this evening follow or fall within the allowable criteria of the ESSER 3 guidelines. As you recall, the purpose of the ESSER 3 fund is to help safely reopen and sustain the safe operation of schools and address the impacts of COVID-19 on the nation's students by addressing students' academic, social, emotional, and mental health needs. Tonight, I will provide an update on the implementation of our ESSER 3 plan that outlines just a few changes within the budget, as well as a few highlights from the FY22 school year. As a reminder, the ESSER 3 plan consists of three categories. The first category is the addressing unfinished learning category, which requires that at least 20% of a total grant award be allocated to address the academic impacts of lost instructional time through the implementation of evidence-based interventions. In a moment, I will share the total allocation for this category, and you will see that we far exceed the required 20% allocation. The second category is the other uses of funds category, which includes all other items that are not reserved to directly address unfinished learning. It is intended that a large part of this grant be allocated to address areas of need as identified by the board and members of the YCSD community. This category may include costs associated with technology, supports for mental health and well-being of students and staff, supports for special populations, family engagement, activities, and indirect costs. The third category is the prevention and mitigation strategies category, which may include the purchase of PPE and supplies, as well as other mitigation measures as appropriate. Next, I will share with you an update on the ESSER 3 budget and explain where funding has been reallocated to meet the needs of the division as we see fit now. Since the inception of the ESSER 3 grant in 2021, the division has been diligent in utilizing grant funding to support the goals of the grant and the needs of the school division. To this end, the updated ESSER 3 plan reflects the division's current needs. While we are only required to allocate 20% of the total grant award to address unfinished learning, we are pleased to share that we continue to allocate more than 45% of the grant award to this category, as prioritizing the academic needs of all students remains a focus for our school division. As a reminder, these funds are awarded on a one-time basis and are to be fully expended by September 2024. In just a moment, I will provide an overview of the updates reflected within the ESSER 3 budget, and I will begin with our staffing update. 
As I've shared with you in previous updates, the SR3 plan includes additional positions to address areas of unfinished learning and provide needed support for our specialized populations. Allocations for FY23 staffing have been updated to reflect the board's most recent play plan and costs associated with benefits. I'm pleased to share with you that the assessment and compliance coordinator, assistive technology autism team coach, English learner coach, and letters trainer positions have all been filled. I'm also very pleased to share that in this proposed update tonight, four virtual instructional associates have been added to the ESSER 3 plan for FY23 to provide some much needed support to students participating in online coursework. These positions are existing and all positions are filled. The gifted services positions have been moved to the local budget to support the sustainability of the division's gifted services model. And because we have been unable to staff the speech and language pathologist position, funding originally allocated to this position will be utilized to provide alternative supports for the communication, of need, communication needs for students with disabilities. As I've also shared in previous updates, all grant funded positions included within the ESSER 3 plan will be dissolved at the conclusion of the grant. However, at the end of the grant term, division staff will evaluate these positions to determine if the existing division's needs required the position to continue and be covered locally. So we'll revisit that at a later time. In my next slide, I will share additional updates to the ESSER 3 plan that reflect the budget changes I shared with you just a moment ago. As the well-being of all students and staff remain a priority for the school division, enhanced mental health supports have been included within our update tonight. As such, ESSER 3 funds are being utilized to provide training to school-based mental health providers on evidence-based strategies to support the needs of both staff and students. These strategies include school safety and crisis preparedness training, as well as youth mental health first aid training for selected staff. We are also very pleased to share that we have utilized ESSER funds to provide all of our schools materials and supplies to support a variety of school-based mental health activities, which will be accessible to all students and staff throughout the school year. Additionally, an adjustment to the indirect, indirect cost rate included within the grant so that it reflects the FY23 rate has also been included. The grant allows school divisions to utilize grant funds to reimburse the school division for administrative and overhead costs associated with implementing our federal programs. In my next slide, I'll share just a few highlights from FY22 to showcase how our ESSER funds have been utilized to support our students and staff. In FY22, F ESSER 3 funds were utilized to provide access to virtual courses offered through our partnership with Virtual Virginia. Last school year, we had students in grades K through 12 participating in the Virtual Virginia program with 142 full-time students and 417 part-time students. Mm -hmm. Another highlight I'd like to share is that ESSER funding has been utilized to hire a full-time letters trainer who trained approximately 80 staff members this past school year on implementing the science of reading throughout instruction. We're very pleased to share that this highly rigorous and engaging training will return this school year with plans to train additional elementary, middle school, and special education staff. And finally, ESSER funding was utilized to provide a robust summer academic program across grade levels PK through 12. This summer's academy included a host of meaningful learning experiences to students that reach beyond typical remediation to include extension, advanced course preparation, as well as exploratory experiences. And Dr. Sherlock will share more about this year's summer academy in his presentation in just a moment. Again, these are just a few highlights from the FY22 academic year. We applaud our students and staff for their hard work through in these endeavors. And following the board update, the revised ESSER 3 plan will be posted to the, the division website, and we will submit the amended budget to the VDOE and continue full implementation of our ESSER 3 plan. Again, all of these changes presented this evening follow or fall within the allowable criteria of the ESSER 3 guidelines, and as required, we will continue to conduct a periodic review of the ESSER 3 plan and provide these updates to the board and community about every six months. And we will review our return to safe in-person instruction and continuity of services plan, which is also available on our school website. At this time, I'm pleased to answer your questions related to the updates on the division's ESSER 3 plan. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Stevenson. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you that this uh, federal money that was given to us was not just spent, okay? It was, uh, it was wisely spent in the sense that my wife was one of those... Uh, uh, that were letter trained, oh, okay. and I got to hear uh, one of the lessons 
as we were driving to Tennessee for about two hours. <laughs> and I tell you what, it was some involved stuff, and it, and, uh, and it was very rigorous training. So I think we got our money's worth with that. We certainly did. And we have till September 2024, is September that what you said, 2024, to yes. Okay. And we will do our best to try to expend by May of 2024, but that is where we have to have our reimbursements done by September okay. 2024. And I'm really grateful for all of the work you guys are doing on mental health and utilizing these funds for that. Yes. I'm really grateful. Anybody else? No, it's a great update. We've been focused on that piece and focused on the reallocation. You've done that. Um, congratulations from a staffing standpoint. Mm -hmm. I know Thank there were some challenges yes. early. Yeah. So thanks, Dr. Stevenson. It was, it was a great update. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. All right, next we'll move into our Summer Academy update. Dr. Carroll. All right, I'll ask Dr. Bob Sherlock to approach the podium. Uh, Dr. Sherlock's the Associate Director of Educational Technology and Innovation. He'll share an update on Summer Academy 2022. The update will include an overview of the elementary, middle, and high school academic programs, enrichment opportunities, and family engagement activities. Dr. Sherlock. Thank you so much. Good evening, Madam, Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Carroll. Tonight, I have the pleasure of showcasing our YCSD Summer Academy programs. I'd like to first introduce our elementary school programs that was led by Ms. Brownlee and Mr. Friedman at the uh, Magruder and at the Yorktown Elementary sites. Together, they created a camp the uh, camping theme for the entire five weeks that, as you can imagine, uh, was a great success for students and even the teachers. They loved coming to school uh, with this camping theme. Uh, they even finished off the, uh, the uh, Summer Academy with s'mores for the last, for the field day. What a way to, ce to celebrate all the learning taking place. Um, this resulted in students, like I said, and teachers having just fun while learning. And the Summer Academy programs focused on three major protocols or, or objectives. The first one was developing those positive student relationships. Um, you know, you can't have learning without having that, that, that positive relationship with students. The second was really creating an engaging culture for students to want to come back, to want to continue learning. And finally, we had targeted instruction where uh, teachers assess students and they, were di they differ differentiate instruction so that our, our summer school or summer academy students will build the skills necessary in that English and math in order for them to be successful in our uh, upcoming school year, win those courses. Uh, these goals continued in our middle school program where uh, Mr. Jones and Mr. Witham led the middle school program, which was held at York, uh, Queens Lake Middle and Yorktown Middle. And again, they served nearly 100, they served 124 students, and they didn't want to have, not have a theme as well. They didn't want to be put up by our, our elementary program. So they had the theme of, um, Summer of Champions, where they wanted the, ch the students to actually be champions of their learning with the support of the teachers. And you know, they also developed those positive relationships. And again, that core instruction with English and math, they really wanted to hit that hard so that the students could be successful in this upcoming school year. But the entire pre-K-12 program in, uh, had STEM intertwined within the English and math so that that way it kind of brought life and excitement, uh, increased the excitement to the English and math curriculum. In addition to the uh, elementary and middle school programs, we had an extended school year ESY program led by Ms. Thackeray, and she served 61, her and her staff served 61 students uh, that worked on their goals and skills based on their individuals, individualized educational plans, or IEPs. At the high school, Ms. Harless and Ms. McNally helped lead students along with teachers and staff. They led 267 students to earn original credit classes and 147 students uh, earned one or more uh, recovery for, for one or more credit recovery courses. On August 29th, seven of our uh, Summer Academy students graduated. They walked the, the cross the finish line and they received their high school diploma, again, because of our Summer Academy program. In all, with our elementary, our middle, and our high school programs, we served 1,010 students with the entire program. However, that's not all we did. As in past years, we ran summer camps, which Ms. Roberts and Ms. Vandegrift, you saw Ms. Vandegrift here earlier, uh, they had uh, two groups of camps, one for elementary, one for middle, where the, the focus really was on supporting the whole student. And you can see a variety of the courses here that, uh, that they helped um, run, from our young authors camp to a STEM camps. And of course, you see the band and the chess camps there. Um, I think we'll have to, after hearing this earlier presentation, we'll have to have an a, uh, environmental science or a uh, natural um, a resources camp of some sort. I think that would be very popular. 
However, in addition to these traditional camps and summer academy programs, we ran two brand new programs uh, to help support our students. The first was our summer, was our high school enrichment program, where it was designed to support our future ready graduates. And this was a collaboration between school board, school board coordinators, uh, career coaches, uh, school counselors, school teachers, and Virginia Peninsula Community College where they, we really developed two strands of high school enrichment courses. The first on the left there is for Workforce, we called Workforce Wednesday, where our career coaches um, led five uh, virtual sessions over five weeks that really got our students ready for uh, career and uh, for workforce readiness uh, for the future. Um, the second program was our college prep program, where the intent was to make sure the students were ready for the rigors of college by taking AP boot camps and PSAT prep courses, but also to have knowledge about, one, how to get into college and how to pay for college. And so again, those were also through virtual classes that were led by our counselors and teachers. Our second new program was actually uh, one that I was super excited about. Um, you saw the, we call it Family Engagement Night. And I, I, the ones I attended, it was great seeing families smiling, students smiling, parents smiling, all while they're learning all about what the great things that York County offers in our schools. Um, and so these were educationally based, but again, the idea was to bring families together so that they are a, a support system where again, they're supporting their students just like we are as well. And you might see a familiar face in the bottom right. One of our, school, uh, our, our principals attended the Crack the Code with her daughter, which is like a, um, a, 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 a breakout box or breakout rooms kind of a environment where they're trying to solve, solve a mystery. Um, in addition, another highlight was our transition to high school had such a, a need that we ran a second program just a week and a half ago where 125 attendees, uh, that includes a rising ninth graders and their parents attended virtually or online or virtually or in person um, to learn about what high school is all about. So that, that, that first year of high school wasn't so scary for the students or of course the parents. Um, I'd like to close tonight's presentation with an email that we received from a parent that I think summarizes this family engagement and actually the entire program quite well. Here's what the, uh, the, the parents said. The activities that YCSD provided brought me closer to my kids and helped me understand some of the learning going on in the school. We want our kids to be successful in the classroom and having some new tools at home will give us the foundation for success. This concludes my presentation. I do want to thank the board for continuing to support these summer programs that benefited so many of our students and families. I'm happy to take any questions or comments at this time. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Yeah, uh, I'm just curious with the, the high school enrichment, the Workforce Wednesday, mm -hmm. college preps, the, those were all online, you Correct, said. Yeah. Do we have any idea about how many people participated in we those? Do, it, was, it was tough because we had, sometimes we had like 10 students and families attend, other times we had up to 30. Okay. So it just depended <coughs> on the number, on I think with the interest and um, on the, sometimes the timing of it. Okay, yeah. thanks. And I just want to comment, I love the innovation you use to uh, excite the students, uh, to get them involved. Uh, not only just the students, but the parents as well. I've heard a lot of positive things about the parent engagement uh, sessions that we've had too, so thank you. Uh, I will say that the team of both administrators and teachers and staff, it was, it was a big project, but I think it, was, it took a, a village to kind of make this run. So it was, yeah, it, it was great seeing all the students so happy and engaged and all the parents involved as well. Perfect, it was wonderful, thank you. Yeah, hats off to the team. I mean, the ability to scale over a thousand, and then you mm -hmm. added the two additional programs, so you're creeping up towards what, 13, 1500? And then also the family engagement helping, particularly new high school parents and yeah. their rising ninth graders kind of crack the code. There's, you know, there's a lot to go into high school, and whether it's workforce readiness and prep or college prep. There's a, there's, there's a lot to be learned, and um, you know, doing something like that to help inform our parents is, uh, yeah, that's a wonderful addition, so thank you, absolutely. Thank now you. what we have to do is figure out how we're gonna do this beyond ESSER, right? <laughs> and, uh, which, is, which is gonna be a challenge, I know, but um, yeah, this, this, was, this is superb, thank you. Yeah. Yes. I know I've, I've shared with you all personally that you know, my nephew uh, attended the transition to high school and I know that his dad was just absolutely blown away um, I know I've shared that personally, but I'm just sharing that tonight, that they just couldn't believe that more people weren't there because he just said it was just all this perfect information that he never knew how he was going to get it all in one place, but he did get it all in one place. So it was really great. And I think even though the panel of uh, the panel we had, we had um, counselors, principals, assistant principals, all there to kind of, again, kind of help, help out and, and um, kind of, I think, 
relax parents and, and give students a little, bit, a little bit of information to make them feel a little, more, you know, a little more at ease when they enter the, the high school mm -hmm. campus. Yeah, it's tremendous momentum coming into the new school year. Yeah. Tremendous momentum well, yeah. out of that program. I mean, when, when you have 400, uh, over 400 kids go through the elementary yeah. uh, summer academy and they are just gonna be chomping at the bit going into the new school year. I mean, it's gonna be great. Yeah. It's, it's fun to see, exciting to see. Yeah, it's exciting, thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Sherlock. Right, thank you. Next, we're gonna go into our student handbook changes. Dr. Carroll. Yes, we'll have Dr. Aaron Butler, Director of School Administration, come to the podium. He's going to provide an update related to student handbook changes. Dr. Butler. Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Carroll, thank you for this opportunity to present the 22-23 <coughs> Student Handbook and Code of Conduct. In June, I presented um, required changes to the handbook that were based on legislative actions of the General Assembly or division-based changes that align to policy, updates, or changes to procedure. At that time, I shared that we were in the process of making significant changes to the layout and design of the handbook to enhance readability, improve ease of use, and comply with ADA compliance. This evening, I will highlight the new layout and review some additional changes that were made to incorporate since the June meeting, which were driven by updates to Virginia Code, revisions to the Virginia Department of Education regulations, and change to division practices. Under section one about us, the layout was changed so that this first section of the handbook focuses more about our school board with information, this new strategic plan, the vision, and the values and priorities, as well as the school directory and hours, and a quick reference guide for families. Section two encapsulated most of the general information and notifications, which includes forms and fees that parents, um, which are important to parents, as well as the requirements for student attendance, enrollment, our annual notifications, and information about transportation for both bus ridership as well as parking and driving on campus. Section three consolidated all of our student learning and success, so you'll find information about instructional programs, homework, grading, as well as student services from special education to preschool services. Section five is a new section which tried to provide families with information about how to address problems in the school by providing flow charts and graphics, as well as how to communicate with the school and if families want to volunteer, as well as school visits on each campus. Section six is the student code of conduct section which includes our code of conduct as well as the rights and responsibilities for students and parents and all our procedures when it comes to appeals of discipline and understanding definitions and terms. And we would like to thank the Public Relations Department for helping with this new layout and for the design that we have currently. So in addition to the layout and changes, there was some content that had to be modified and it was not removed from the student code of conduct and the handbook, it was just that we provided direct links to this information. For example, in instruction, the program of studies, there was a direct link now that goes to the actual program of studies on our York um, County School Division website. For non-discrimination, it was not eliminated, it was just consolidated with our policy on harassment and retaliation, as well as for student records, rather than having the entire policy in the handbook, the direct link was linked on board docs to that particular policy. The same thing with for interscholastic athletic activities and for FERPA rights for families, that's also a direct link to the United States Department of Education. There are a few major content deletions for the instruction under testing and assessment. The Naglieri test was deleted um, because the new COGAT test is used to replace that for the universal screener. <laughs> on the fine arts, there was a section on fine arts which was completely deleted, and that's only because it's also in the program of studies with a fuller definition. And there was a slight change to the math, science, and technology magnet at York Elementary School. That is now a project lead the way school, so language had to be changed to reflect that. There were several parts of the handbook that were deleted. Again, these were not deleted because of get rid of the content, but it was to be replaced by uh, information that was consolidated. For example, for Library Media Center, that was replaced with student resources. 
with academic achievement. It was replaced because it was all rolled into the honor roll section. And if you go through the list for clubs and activities, again, they were referred back to our policy. Social networking was added into the new AUP policy. And then for enrollment requirements, the link was direct, direct families to the website where all that information is listed for them. There was some content that was added to align with division practice. So under student health and safety, safety terms, you'll notice that there were some definitions. Um, but prior to this handbook, we did not have the words evacuation, lockdown, modified lockdown, and hold in place. We provided that clarification for families so they would understand what those terms are. In addition, there was a new committee, uh, the Career and Technical Education Advisory Committee. So language was added to clearly define the roles and guidelines for participation on that committee. Some additional content was added to align with legislative actions. For general information for excused absences, the General Assembly passed legislation saying that students who participate or attend American, uh, Native American tribal powwow ceremonies, that is an excused absence, as long as those tribes are recognized by the Commonwealth of Virginia. And then for students who participate in 4-H camps, those camps are treated as a field trip as long as they've been uh, pre-approved by the school. Under the Code of Conduct for Behavior Codes, there was a re refinement of the code for persistently dangerous behaviors. And so PD-15, which is possession of other firearms, there was some code changes that makes that something that's reportable to law enforcement. And that was added to the handbook. There was a few revisions because of Department of Education regulation changes. So BS-04 was failed to be in once assigned place. That code was removed and it was replaced by two additional codes, BSO 15, student is not going to class as assigned, and BOS 16, which is student is an unauthorized area of campus. For threat assessments, that code was also broken out due to changes in Virginia regulations. So BESO 13, threats and intimidating or instigating violence, when it is not in a written form, and then BESO 14 is when it is in a written form. So those are the only changes with that code. Um, as a reminder, um, this handbook will come to you tonight um, on the consent agenda item to be voted upon. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to present the new layout and the information for the 22-23 student handbook. I'm available for questions at this time. I mean, it's not really a question. I just want to thank you and your team for, for going over. I'm sure each year you, you update, create, do revisions, and you think there's no way this is it. Like, there's no way we're going to have to change anything. And then every year we find, you know, new stuff. So I just want to thank you for the time you put into it. I, I especially like some of the changes uh, to it for the readability, as you were saying. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's the presentation and the layout and everything is really nice. So thank yeah. you. That's one of our goals, to engaging, more engaged, improve engagement. And the user experience, frankly, is... is is significantly improved, so hats off to the team. Thank you. Are we handing this out to students um, electronically, or are we still doing a hard copy as well? So we are still, because we switched to electronic means, we are pushing that. However, we always make a few copies. There are some families that still like a, a hard copy, and they want to put their hands on it. And so we are making um, a few copies for families, but the majority of our families, because um, they will have this access online um, okay. for them to use, because the forms, of course, are on RICOR as well. Perfect. Anybody else? All right, thank you, Dr. Butler. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. Next, we'll move into our safety and security update. Dr. Carroll. All right, thank you. I'll ask Dr. Butler to stay at the podium. He's going to share an update relating to safety and security, and I know he has a couple special guests at the end of his presentation. <laughs> Dr. Butler. Okay. okay. Well, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Carroll. I would like to thank you for this opportunity to pre present to you and our community updates regarding safety and security in our schools. Historically, we present every November our actions designed to promote safe and secure schools. Tonight, I'm going to highlight some of our safety and security practices. This is not an exhaustive list, and there are some practices that we do not share with the public for obvious reasons. Our approach is multi-layered and follows generally accepted security best practices and involves consultation and planning with the York Pocosin Sheriff Office. Our five layers include hardening campuses, technology assistance, safety drills, proactive planning processes, and threat assessments. A common practice related to school safety 
is the physical hardening of buildings. These actions are designed to keep bad actors out and to slow down those individuals who would try to access our buildings with unauthorized. We engage several technology-based methods to foster safe schools. One is the 800 megahertz radio provides direct communication to 911, the school board office, and to other division schools. Our A phone system provides building entry and directs visitors to the main office for check-in. This is followed by having to go through our identikit system, which runs automatic background checks on all individuals and visitors who enter our buildings. Division staff are required to wear badges, which grants them both access and allows us to track their entry and exit out of our buildings. We also have technology to make sure that we are providing supervision for our schools for arrival, dismissal, doing cafeteria time, hallway, and doing assemblies. Lockdown drills only work if staff and students practice these actions. We conduct four lockdown drills per year in addition to other safety drills, and in the past year, we have engaged in tabletop training exercises with our executive leadership team, our building administrators, and this has been conducted in collaboration with the Yorkville Coast and Sheriff Office. We also engage in a number of practices that are designed to be proactive. Most important is our reported feature. Traditionally, our families and students have always been willing to share information and report things to us. Um, our office is one of the offices that when someone does make a report, it directly comes to us. It's not something that sits um, at, at a random desk, but all of us get notifications, our department and other members of the school board office so that we can react immediately to those particular concerns. One of the things that we always share as families, if you see something, you, you should say something, and you should always try to report it to school staff so that we can intervene. Second, we have a long and exemplary partnership with the York Coast and Sheriff Office. We conduct state surveys on students, we use documents for an inspection of our facilities, and we have a comprehensive crisis management plan to guide school and divisions through crisis situations. York County School Division adopted the Department of Criminal Justice Threat Assessment Model to proactively manage potential safety threats and risks through interventions, staff resources, and supports. The Code of Virginia requires every school to assess threats using a team approach, and in all of our buildings, we have teams that are composed of counselors, administrators, school psychologists, law enforcement, and social workers to support that effort. There are some new and recent activities that we will be engaging upon. For Bailey Field and Bruton High School football stadium, there are a few changes in security. Effective September the 1st, the York Coast and Sheriff Office will be increasing their presence by one third. Metal detectors and or wands for all spectators at high school football games, and we will have a clear bag <coughs> procedures for all events at our two venues. In addition, we have expanded cameras to include our entire bus fleet using on a daily basis. The board may remember that there was two additional SROs that were added to our middle school, so now we have four SROs at the middle school and four SROs at our high schools. We have completed security vestibules at Queens Lake Middle School this week, which means that all of our campuses are equipped with a security vestibule. And we conducted a live action drill on August the 2nd at York High School for all of our school-based administrators. At this time, I would like to ask Major Montgomery and Captain Hahn to join me and share some additional information concerning school safety. Good evening. Thank you for having us here tonight. <laughs> As we all know, security across the nation is a concern for all the school districts. Unfortunately, some recent events have showed us that merely having a plan doesn't guarantee success in, in the event that, God forbid, you have an active shooter event at a school. One of the things that's been talked about tonight that I would agree with in my career here, we've had an outstanding relationship with the York County School Division, and we've worked collaboratively for many, many years to work on security. Captain Hahn, many years ago, probably at least 10 years ago, 
took on the, the really difficult task of making sure that all the schools had the exact same plan. When he first came on board and started looking at this, there was different plans in different areas of the schools. He fixed that situation. Not only did he make the, the plan one and the same, but he works on the drills on a regular basis. The law requires that twice a year we have active lockdown or active shooter drills. Many school divisions around here, you may be aware of, simply walk through and check a box. That's never been good enough for Captain Hahn. I know the people that work in the school division understand that and understand the importance of it. We actually put the school in lockdown and practice to drill so that everybody in the building knows exactly what's going to happen or what to expect to happen so it becomes sort of muscle memory in the event that something like this was to happen. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a shooter drill. It could be any type of intruder on the campus that poses a threat. One of the things, though, that I wanted to work on is we work very well with the school division with these drills. We also work with the fire department on a very regular basis in natural disasters, fires, accident scenes. So we work with the component of the schools, we work with the component of the fire department, but we've never done a drill where all three of us were in a, involved in the same drill to see how would we work collaboratively, because we all have different roles and responsibilities. I know we all work on our segments of the plan, but we never put that in place all together in the same time. So what we came up with on August the 2nd was the first of two trainings. The first one was to gauge the response in the event that we had a tr a, an active shooter event in one of the schools in York County. How would the school respond? How quickly would the information be relayed to the office and the office put the school in lockdown and we be notified from the sheriff's office? How quickly would the sheriff's office respond and be able to get there and move to the threat? Would we do the things that we've been trained to do, which is move directly to the threat until it's been nullified? How would the fire department respond to us? We have situations across the country where if you have an active shooter and you have wounded, the fire department and the sheriff's office have to work collaboratively to be able to provide security so the fire department can remove the wounded and be able to take them away to the hospital for treatment. Never had we done this process. So on August the 2nd, we implemented this plan at York High School and we practiced it. And prior to that, we had a tabletop exercise in the cafeteria where all of the, the faculty and, and principals and assistant principals were there. And I listened to a lot of the comments there. You should be commended. You have done some outstanding training in the York County School Division. I was really impressed when they were presented with questions that they hadn't heard before, hadn't had, a time, had any chance to rehearse collaboratively while on the table did an outstanding job of answering the questions. Another individual that I need to mention that's been a tremendous help with this is, is a man named Matt Overton. I met Matt Overton several years ago when he was charged with putting together a regional training plan at Bush Gardens in January of the year. His role was to bring federal, local, and state law enforcement together to solve a plan that in the event of an active shooter at Bush Gardens with 30,000 people and it was a domestic terrorism situation, how would all of those functions work together, federal, state, and local? It was a massive undertaking and an outstanding job. And I remember thinking to myself after meeting him, at some point in time, I was going to steal him. <laughs> well, I was fortunate enough last July to, to get that position. He now works for us. He's been doing a lot of training with the schools, and I know that it's going to pay off in the long run. So we still have a second part of the drill to do, which will begin after the active shooter has been negated, and how will the school PIOs work together and law enforcement, the school division, and the fire department actually work in a combined unified command scenario, because now we're going to have to face the situation of parents arriving on campus, how are we going to move the kids to another campus or another place for reunification, and make sure that all that's done in an orderly manner so that we can account for each and every one of the students. And I look forward to that drill in the near spring. It was an outstanding training. And again, I commend the school division for the work they've done and the progress they've made with this training. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I know a few of us attended that training. And again, <coughs> kudos to you and your team. I know that we all felt very, very strongly that we were grateful to have the partnership that we had. Um, we definitely appreciated that training too. It was very eye-opening, um, really just wonderful. Uh, I've always seen the training from the law enforcement side, uh, so it was, it was very imperative or very uh, interesting to me 
to see it from the school division side and um, thinking about the other things that the division had to think about uh, during that situation. So it was wonderful training, great training, and um, looking forward to the, the spring one. Yeah, I, I know you can't talk about specific details and <coughs> protocols of some, uh, uh, some of those drills, but um, Major Montgomery, what can we do as a community? What is the most important thing that we can do to ensure that our students and staff are safe in and around the buildings? Well, one of the things we can do is practice this on a regular basis. Um, we can't get lax. One of the things, I don't know how many of you have read the Evaldi 77-page report. They got complacent because of the fact of what they call bailout drills down there. Apparently, it's fairly gotten fairly routine that if local law enforcement was chasing illegal immigrants coming from Mexico and they would bail out of vehicles, the schools would go into lockdown and it got to the point where this became basically commonplace and became they became complacent about it. So starting at the top, which is this group right here, it's important to emphasize down through the division how important it is that each and every one of these drills mm -hmm. is taken seriously and each time that you go into lockdown that you do the things that Captain Hahn is teaching on a regular basis. That's the best thing that you can do to secure the security of your students and your staff. Okay, what about the community parents, stuff like uh, people like that around that aren't directly connected with the, the building? Well, one of the trainings that I'm putting together now and I've tasked Matt with working on is it occurred to me that we do a lot of it on the school side where we talk to the school division and the students know what's going on, but we've kind of left the parents out. They're kind of in the dark as to what's happening. Recent events in Arizona, this couple of weekends ago, where they had an active shooter situation, fortunately it didn't turn out to be that, but they had parents showing up on campus concerned basically because of what happened in Uvalde. And it turned out to, it got to the point where a couple of parents were actually arrested because they became so disruptive. And what I'm getting Matt to do, and we're gonna reach out to the PTAs to try to get their cooperation with this as well, is to develop a program where we can come in and talk to the parents and say, here's what happens at the school. We can't give you all of the security details, obviously, but the school is going to go into lockdown. You're not going to be allowed to get into the school. We have a job to do to go into the school. If you come to the school, it's a possibility that if you disrupt enough of it, we might use valuable resources that could be used to take care of the problem inside to deal with this. So we're hoping to put together a program that we can present to the parents through the PTOs or, the, or what other organizations there are in the school division so that we can get enough of them to understand, here's what we want you to do. Listen to the information coming from the PIO. Go to the reunification center that's identified. You're not going to be able to let, take your child from the school because the sheriff's office and the school division is going to have to know where every student is because if two or three parents are allowed to take their kids and we go through the roll, now we've got to go back into a 100,000 square foot building to make sure they're not hiding somewhere or that we've missed them. We're going to account for every one of them. So we hope to present that segment to the parents in the near future. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we've, we've made significant strides. I was able to observe um, both the tabletop exercises, Major Montgomery, as you were building to the integrated event uh, hosted earlier this month. But what you're speaking to, and obviously we're all speaking to, is frankly a mindset. And I've, and I've seen within the division, particularly in the last 24 months or so, uh, you know, a significant adjust in mindset. And, um, you know, it will be required, as you know, Major Montgomery, in the community as well, as we continue, you know, to improve and add these additional layers um, as we increase, you know, our mindset from a security and safety standpoint. So thanks, thanks very much. But as Dr. Butler said, I think it's very important that uh, uh, the community as a whole, if they see something, they say something. Exactly because, right. Uh, they have to work in concert with the schools and with the sheriff's office to be able to make sure that these terrible things don't happen. And that's one of the things that we're talking to the SROs about this year, to make that message clear to the students in the high schools that they've got to get over that stigma of cons being concerned about reporting something they see online, because I could give you numerous examples of where that saved lives. Yeah. Dr. Carroll? Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. I know that Dr. Shandor would want to thank you, Major Montgomery, for your leadership on these uh, drills that we're working on now. Uh, Bringing all three agencies together was a first, and I think it made for a better experience for all of us. 
And also I want to thank you for the philosophy of the department that you're going to confront the threat immediately. I think that's something that we've seen as a fault around the country. And I know that we have confidence because we saw that philosophy in action in the drill. So thank you for that also. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we're going to move into comments of citizens and our public participation at board meetings. Uh, before I open up for public comments, I will share some remarks. The school board provides a public comment period for the public to comment on topics germane to the business of the school board. The school board expects that each speaker will be courteous. Bottling for our students how one can respectfully disagree with others' views. We ask that speakers address their comments to the entire school board and not to one individual board member, nor to the superintendent, a staff member, or the audience. Speakers will present their comments from the podium. Each speaker may speak for up to three minutes. A timer is visible to speakers from the podium, and speakers should conclude their remarks when the red light comes on. The timer will begin after you state your name and address. I now open the public participation uh, for comments by citizens. Looks like we have one person signed up to speak. Deb Wesley. Good evening, um, Chairman, Vice Chair, Chairwoman, excuse me, I'm so <laughs> sorry. Uh, um, members of the board, Dr. Carroll. Um, my name is Deb Wesley, and I live at 902 Dare Road in Yorktown, Virginia. I am here tonight um, as the new president of the York Education Association, and I am preparing to start my 34th year of teaching in York County, and I consider it an honor and a privilege to um, work in York County. Um, just listening to everything tonight has been um, just heartwarming and um, incredible to listen to all of the presentations. So I wanted to start out by thanking you, the school board, Dr. Carroll, all of the members, um, all of the employees at the school board office. The last few years have been um, tough to say the least in all sense of the words for many of us. Our entire school community has faced a lot of challenges. Um, we faced a lot of challenges and hurdles and hopefully we have all emerged stronger and ready to move forward in the new school year. It sure sounds like it and I love the stuff in the ESSER grant. Um, on behalf of um, the school board off, I mean, I'm sorry, on behalf of the York Education Association, I also want to thank everybody for the, the pay increases, the step increases, and another thank you to the calendar committee. Um, and I spoke with Dr. Vladu earlier about some of those unencumbered days um, planning for teachers. Time is such a precious commodity for um, teachers to plan those engaging and meaningful lessons that having some of those unencumbered days will make a huge difference for us. So thank you for that. Um, as we move forward, you probably remember I am a reading specialist, so I tie everything to a book. I do have a book to share tonight. It is the book called because, and it is by Mo Wilhelms. He is a prolific children's author, most notable known for Piggy and Elephant books and The Pigeon, you know, Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus. This book is called Because. And I chose this book because it's one of discovery, influence, and persistence. The young girl here on the cover discovers a love of music through chance, discovery she gets to go to a concert um, but it goes much deeper than that there's a lot of persistence involved there's a lot of community and collaboration involved in her getting and being successful in the music career field she ends up writing music so forth so it just made me think about the accent on academics and how this book theme these themes tie into accent on, that accent on academics which was amazing tonight so um, it aligns with a lot of the strategic plan, and I'm going to run out of time, and I just want to say the York Education Association looks forward to supporting the York County strategic plan in combination with the school board and everyone there. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Ms. Wesley. <clears throat> I don't have anybody else signed up to speak. Is there anybody else here who wishes to make comments? Yes, absolutely. Come on up. Would you state your name and address when you arrive up there? Thank you. Daryl Cubel, CUBA okay. senior. 
9702 John Clayton Memorial Highway, Gloucester, Virginia. Okay. I've been with York County, oh, well, Madam, Boyd, Dr. Carroll, uh, and I'm uh, Daryl Cooper. I've been with York County for over 20 years, custodian. Now, I just wanted to say that the custodian department, I know that, uh, Mr. Dolak and Mr. George Lance, you know, we have worked our behind off. We have gone above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, three minutes already? All right. No, I'm, I'm reset. All right. But <laughs> again, I just want to say that we have, uh, I can't say how much since some of the guys retired, Mr. Albert. Uh, he has, he been 37, 38 years. He has worked in other capacity overboard. Uh, if I had a million dollars, I would give him about 500. Because uh, he, this man has done great work. He, he's, I can't say it. He's a well around guy. He, he getting ready to retire. And I told him I would come in here to speak on his behalf. And I'd like to ask the school board. I'm trying to get a metal detector in the schools. I'm still crying and hurting down there in Texas. I'm from Texas. I'm crying. 19 kids, two it's teachers. I'm hurting. I'm still hurting. I had 10 kids. But I'm, I'm, just, I'm just overwhelmed. I'm just hurting. Uh, I don't know if it can. I don't know if y'all can in the school system. I'm trying to get up nationwide, but I need to start here. I don't know if y'all can do it, metal detectors in the schools. I said I'm going to just bring it up. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Anyone else? All right, I close the public participation for comments by citizens, and next we'll move into matters by board members. And we'll start with Mr. Richardson. All right, thank you very much. Um, the division has sponsored a couple of leadership opportunities over the summer that uh, we've all attended, of course, a lot of us have. Um, one that we did for, for principals, new principals in positions, and they did another one for uh, other employees in the division and the region. Um, so I really thank you for doing that. That was a lot to put together, and uh, the speakers are always awesome in those, uh, the, the beginning of those presentations. Um, the Trago Ed training that they continue to provide to uh, our new employees. I mean, we've all seen the Trago Ed and how it works from our end, but we've never seen it from the decision-making end. And let me tell you, it's a lot of work, <laughs> uh, a lot of work to go through, but it was interesting to see the process and, and how it develops. So um, my kudos to uh, the division and all the training they've done over the summer and uh, keep up the great work. Mr. <clears throat> um, yeah, I just, uh, we talked about it some, but I want to further just highlight and thank um, the administrators, the teachers, the counselors, the um, paraeducators, the um, custodian, <clears throat> custodial staff that worked through the summer academies, because we talk about you know, May and June, you know, like the, the idea of teacher burnout and pushing to the end. And then we, we get to the end, we all celebrate that year. And then a week and a half later, those people are back in the building starting over and providing these opportunities for the, you know, 1,500 plus, you know, kids that participate in the different events between the Summer Academy and the, the different clubs and the new uh, uh, opportunities. And we, we need to, I, I know we, offer you know compensation for their time and effort but it's nowhere near what what they should get you know what we're able to to provide and they do that because they love kids they do it because they want to provide the best opportunities for kids so i just want to highlight and thank all of those people who participated in that um, while we talk about relaxing on break you know they're still going in at 7 a.m and some of them not leaving till 7 p.m again you know um, working with those. So I just want to thank everybody from the bottom of my heart for providing those opportunities for all of those students. Uh, as Mr. Richardson said, the, uh, the leadership opportunities, you know, that we provided not just for York County, but uh, the regional leadership summit, we had people from Chesapeake and Virginia Beach who came over to participate in that. The uh, keynote speaker came down from, was it Michigan, Dr. Joe Sanfilippo, um, and spoke, and it was, it was very moving and, and uh, motivational uh, for that. And I just want to thank uh, 
everyone for the opportunity and the discussions that you know I was able to hear <coughs> and that the leaders right here, not just in York County, but uh, everywhere is focused on, on providing those opportunities. And it's so important as we start that new year that we continue to fill our cups. Um, and that's a way for us to do it. So we're, we are energized and ready uh, for that next step. Um, and I want to thank the uh, coaches and the band directors and everyone that's those kids have already been out there for weeks practicing you know for that you know games start before school begins you know in some cases and, and everything so I want to thank all of those people putting in the extra time and, and working and providing those opportunities for those students to be able to um, show off and use their skills uh, in, in the ways that they're comfortable with and, and uh, gifted and I also want to thank uh, the um, the food distribution that we were able to do throughout the summer too. I, I don't know, I, I haven't had a chance to ask, but I'm sure all those meals that are prepared are so helpful for those families who, who need the, um, who might have some food insecurity or some kids don't know where their next meal could be coming from. And for us to be able to continue to provide that for, for those families, I think is, is great. And I just wanted to highlight some of those things as we're starting the year. And I just want to remind everyone as you're going into the, the school, whether you're a student, whether you're a teacher or, or administrator or anyone else that works with students, an impact is made no matter who you are. And it's the, the attitude and the idea of what you do in the class is going to change that impact that you have. And so you think about preparing for that <coughs> positive impact can completely change someone's trajectory, uh, whether it's a, an adult or a student or a child in the building. So I just wanted you to remember as we move forward that impact you make can be a lasting uh, impact on, on someone else, even though you may not remember it 30 seconds down the line. So that's all I had to say. And I'm going to piggyback on that, uh, on that impact, uh, because one of the things that we did in the new teacher orientation was we turned to each other and had to uh, share a momentous time with one of our teachers that had an impact on us. And, uh, and just to hear the stories, uh, it was very neat. It really was, because teachers, you have more impact than you can ever imagine. And we have uh, some of the top teachers in the country right here in York County. But Summer Academy was a success, I would say. And getting to go to the graduation and seeing the seven graduates uh, was just awesome. That was great. On, uh, that was in, at the end of July. But then uh, when we went to the new teacher orientation, there was a, it was electrifying. Between 140 and 160 new teachers were there, and it was just an exciting time. I mean, I loved it. It was my first one and, uh, at Grafton Middle School, and it was great. Uh, and I just wanted to let everyone know, Bruton High School football is back, <laughs> OK? <laughs> they have 53 kids on the roster this year. They have a JV team. The pit is going to be turf. It's going to happen. And uh, Bruton High School is definitely back when it comes to football. I want to just uh, thank all the, the principals, even the new APs, uh, with all the new teachers that came on. They are thinking outside the box and uh, providing motivational time and fellowship time for, their, for the teachers. I got to attend one at Shoe Fly uh, Dairy Bar up in Williamsburg and had a milkshake with all the new teachers from Magruder. And, uh, and I got to go over and, and meet the new uh, teachers and all the existing teachers over at Waller Mill. Just had a great time. Uh, open house is coming up Wednesday and Thursday. So if you want to see what your kids are doing uh, when, you, uh, when they go to school, you can find out. Go to open house. They're all in the evening, even the high schools, so everybody can see what's going on. Uh, I'm just looking forward to a nice, normal, wonderful year. And it's just going to be great. I'm excited. Schaefer. Mr. Myatt. A lot of positive momentum. <laughs> so we've, we've got a lot of momentum coming yeah. into the year. Um, again, greatly appreciate all the division and obviously what teachers have done. School has started, as we've said. Essentially, we've got coaches and band directors mm -hmm. and choral. Everybody's out doing their thing. But we've got tremendous momentum. And we were able to welcome new leaders uh, this evening. Um, we're very, very fortunate in the county. We attract great leaders, but we also grow great leaders. Um, so I know in District 5, for instance, uh, we've got, um, you know, three new principals, and um, we have complete confidence in them and uh, in their teams. And um, again, we've got great momentum going into the year, so looking very much forward to it. Thank you, Mr. Myatt. 
Um, I'm just going to take a quick second. I'm not going to talk about the things we went to this year, but I wanted to think, um, explain the theme that came up at everything we went to. We had a lot of outside speakers and new staff members from other counties, other cities, other states. And every time you would talk to somebody, they would say, whoa, you guys don't even know what kind of a great community you live in. And it was like over and over and over that, that people kept saying that to us. I know they said it to you guys just like they were saying it to me. And so for me, it was like, <clears throat> we do live in this amazing community. And I think we're all trying to push and move towards the exact same goal, work together. Um, and I just want to make sure that we're reminding everybody in the community to let's all have a positive attitude as we go into this year, because we all need that. The last couple of years have been very, very rough. Um, and we're all on the same team, and we're really lucky to live here, live in this community, especially with the great partnerships that we have. So, again, just really looking forward to this year being positive and all of us working together as a team. Thank well you. Said. Well said. Yes. All right, next we move into the fun stuff, financial matters. I'll now yeah. ask Mr. Richardson to discuss financial matters. Thank you. I have financial matters uh, claims certified for payment for the months of June and July, and all of this information is posted on board docs. If you'd like the more detailed version, I'm just going to highlight the highlights here. Uh, significant expenditures for June uh, include a total of $667,900, most notable academic therapy publications, $139,900 for high noon decodable text for reading intervention, New Horizons, $178,900 for special education services, MPS, MPS $65,115 for geography and English textbooks, uh, Perfection Learning, $78,800 for AP Language Composition Textbooks. William & Mary, $52,998 for the Spring and Summer Cohort Program. And technology-related expenditures totaled $870,000, include payments to CDW, which was $774,100 for Microsoft Software Renewal, Server Replacement, Division Wireless Upgrade, and adapters for the one-to-one -one devices. And then <clears throat> the food services expenditures totaled uh, just under a million dollars was $910,350 and included payments to Sodexo for $874,600 $874, for May and June food service operations. And then construction related expenditures totaled $2.7 million to include payments to RRM Architects uh, for $42,200 for design work at Seaford Elementary. Heartland, $1.6 million for the Seaford renovation and expansion project. Simpson Unlimited, one million for the York High Roof Replacement Project. And then payments related to administration totaled approximately $149,350, included payments to Frontline Technologies, $92,300, and that was for the new HR information system. Uh, Bionaut Visual Communications, $20,600 for audiovisual services for the 2022 graduation. And operational related expenditures total $204,900 to include payments to Dominion Energy for utility services of $154,900, NIT Incorporated $10,000 for replacement of a grinder pump at Bethel Manor Elementary School. And then one payment for transportation was made to RK Chevrolet totaling, totaling $67,000 for the replacement of two cargo vans. Now significant expenditures for July of 2022. Instructional related expenditures totaled 369600 for payment to Vista Higher Learning for Spanish and French textbooks. IT related expenditures totaled 189800 <clears throat> to include payments to X2 Development, which was 106400 for Aspen Student Information System, a program that we use at all of our schools. Uh, payments related to administration totaling 532900 to include payment to the Virginia Risk Sharing Association for liability, property, automobile, and workers' compensation insurance. Construction and maintenance-related expenditures, 318900 to include payments to Centennial contractors for work at Tab Elementary Playground, Queens Lake Gym Floor, Bruton High Gym Repairs, and School Board Security Vestibule, and drainage improvements at Coventry Elementary. So operations maintenance related expenditures totaled 29,300 to include payments to American Refrigeration for miscellaneous supplies and Degler Whiting 14,100 for gym divider curtain at Mount Vernon Elementary. July revenues, the revenue for July 2022 increased, increased more than 325,000 when compared to the previous year. This is a result of an increase in state funding for the FY 2023. 
and for expenditures, instructional expenditures for July 2022 increased approximately $500,000 when compared to the previous year. This is primarily due to expansion of the Summer Academy, payment for textbooks ordered at the end of FY22, and the planned compensation increase for FY23. For revenues and expenditures, there are no significant changes in revenue or expenditures in the food service budget. And for re resolution 22-38 requires the board's approval, authorizing procurements of more than $50,000, and there are 10 items on this resolution totaling $1.14 million, and the details, again, can be reviewed on board docs. Madam Chair, I move we approve financial matters as listed. Can I get a second? A second. Ms. Ford? Yes, the motion is made by Mr. Richardson and seconded by Mr. Schaefer to approve financial matters as listed. Board members, you may cast your vote. <coughs> the motion passed five to zero. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ford. The next one will have a consent calendar. Uh, we have approval of personnel actions, approval of minutes for special meetings at 3.30 and 7, and a work session at 6 on May 9th, 2022, <coughs> special meeting on May 16th, 2022, a regular meeting on May 23rd, 2022, a special meeting and work session on June 13th, 2022, a special meeting on June 13th, 2022, and a special meeting on July 27th, 2022. We have approval of donations in the amount of $40,375.21. We have approval of fiscal year 2023 proposed budget calendar. We have approval of the student handbook changes. Um, and uh, we need a motion to approve the consent calendar. As Madam listed. Chair, I move we approve the consent calendar as you listed. I'll second. Ms. Ford? Was that Mr. Maya that seconded it? Yes. Thank you. A motion to approve the consent calendar <coughs> was listed. It was made by Mr. Richardson and seconded by Mr. Myatt. Board members, you may cast your vote. The motion passed five to zero. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ford. Next, we'll have, move into our action items. Uh, first, we have a consideration of approval of Resolution 22-39, a resolution requesting the Board of Supervisors to issue general obligation school bonds for school purposes and consenting to the issuance thereof. Dr. Carroll. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll ask Mr. Bill Bowen, Chief Financial Officer, uh, up to the podium. He's going to provide comments <coughs> pertaining to this resolution. Thank you, Dr. Carroll, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Carroll. Um, the first uh, resolution requiring action this evening is Resolution 2239. This resolution requests the Board of Supervisors to issue a maximum of $20,415,000 in bonds and submit an application to sell the bonds to the VPSA, which is the Virginia uh, Public School Authority. The bond proceeds will cover the cost of bond-related projects as approved in the Board of Supervisors capital improvements program for the school division for fiscal years 22 and 23. This resolution is presented for, uh, for the school board's consideration at the request of county staff so that they may proceed in securing financing for those projects. Any questions? All right, I need a motion and a second. I move to approve resolution 22-39, a resolution requesting the Board of Supervisors to issue general obligation school bonds for school purposes and consenting to the issuance thereof. I'll second. Board? Yes, the motion is made by Mr. Higginbotham and seconded by Mr. Schaefer to approve resolution 22-39. You may cast your vote. The motion passed five to zero. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ford. Next, we have a consideration of approval of Resolution 22-40, a resolution declaring its intention to reimburse itself from the proceeds of one or more grants made by the Commonwealth of Virginia for certain expenditures made and or to be made in connection with certain capital improvements. Dr. Carroll. Mr. Bowen will provide comments relating to this resolution. Mr. Bowen. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Carroll, um, this, the second resolution requiring action is uh, Resolution 2240. Uh, the General Assembly continues authorizing the Virginia Public School Authority to issue education technology notes to support the education technology grant program. Um, for YCSD, the state grant totals approximately $544,000 every uh, each year, and there is a local match requirement of $108,800. Um, what this breaks down to is it, the state funds $26,000 per school, so 19 schools, and then $50,000 for the division to support tech its technology program. And so we're, um, this, this action is to approve the state's um, issuance of those technology grants. 
to the school division. Any questions? All right, we need a motion and a second. I move to approve resolution 22-40, declaring its intention to reimburse itself from the proceeds of one or more grants made by the Commonwealth of Virginia for certain expenditures made and or made in connection with certain capital improvements. A second. Ms. Ford? Yes, the motion was made by Mr. Hickenbotham and seconded by Mr. Richardson to approve resolution 2240. Board members, you may cast your vote. The motion passed five to zero. Thank you. All right, next, we move into our policy discussion, and our first one is policy section I, instruction. And it's also policy GAB of the York County School Board Policy Manual. Dr. Carroll. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll ask Ms. Candy Skinner, Chief Academic Officer for the division. She's going to, up to the podium. She's going to provide information relating to policy section I. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Carroll. After review and revision by the superintendent, chief officers, and deputy county attorney, section I of the York County School Board, as well as fi um, file GAB, is ready for review by the York County School Board. Many of the proposed revisions, which are detailed in the board brief that you see here on the screen, are a result of the alignment with the Virginia School Board Association policy manual, while others reflect current practice and are not part of the VSBA policy manual. As required by VSBA, Policies adopted verbatim from its manual retain the VSBA copyright symbol. As an overview, eight files were retained with no changes. Eight files were retained with editorial changes only. Thirteen files were revised with minimal changes, with new language adopted all or in part from the VSBA policy manual. One new file was added to the policy, and that's file IJD, titled College and Career Readiness. This file provides for the early identification and exploration of college and career readiness for elementary and secondary students. 35, excuse me, 30 files were revised with substantive changes. The new language was adopted all or in part from the VSBA policy manual. Two examples of those include file IGAJ, which is driver education, which incorporates an additional parent-student driver education component as part of the classroom portion of the driver education curriculum. Another example is file IGAE, IGAF, which is health education, physical education. This aligns to the Virginia School Board Association policy, and the changes define the components of health instruction, the hourly requirements for physical activity, and the incorporation of a personal safety training for grades seven and eight. Additionally, because there were changes made to file IIBEA, acceptable computer system use, you'll notice that there are also changes made to file GAB, acceptable computer system use. This was done in order to replicate these policies. And lastly, there was one file that is um, proposed to be deleted, and that is file IX, instructional professional development. And this is because the information in this policy is already included in policy GCL, the deletion is not associated with any change in policy. It is recommended at this time to schedule the proposed revisions to section I, instruction of the school board policy manual for a first reading pursuant to the school board policy on policy manual revisions. I know this is a very big document that we're all going to need to read. <laughs> yeah, I so. started, but yeah, it's a, it's a big one yeah. to read. Yeah, yeah. So it's a lot. We will definitely be ready at our work session to ask questions after we're all familiar Absolutely. with it. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next, we have policy. Um, first reading, we have none. Uh, second reading, uh, also none. And uh, then we move into report of the superintendent, Dr. Carroll. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to begin with a little bit of clarification. Uh, Mr. Word, who is here from RRMM. Uh, that uh, money that was on that check doesn't go to Dr. Shandor. Uh, that's going to be a pass-through. He's awarding that to a student of need that's going to be uh, attending Virginia Peninsula Community College, so I wanted you to know that. Uh, we also have started the rollout of your strategic plan, or our strategic plan, and so over the last couple of weeks, there's been a lot of effort to uh, you know, extend that rollout and make sure that all of our employees understand and know the missions and the visions and the goals of your plan. And so that, uh, that rollout continues. I'd also like to <clears throat> reach out to the school community. Uh, we are almost ready to start school. 
However, we do have uh, a good number of openings still. We still have a number of positions in special education as far as teachers, and we have a great need for paraeducators in the division. Uh, we are uh, we're looking for about 50 of those. Now that is where we were at last year, but we're asking the school community if you know anybody that uh, you know, might be interested in one of those positions to encourage that person to apply with the school division. In addition to those items, uh, a few of you mentioned the Leadership Academy. The division's annual two-day Leadership Academy included over 105 leaders in the division, including principals, assistant principals, uh, instructional coordinators and testing coordinators from each school along with the central office staff. Uh, the morning general session, which I know some of you were at, included a keynote speaker, Dr. C.J. Huff, who shared relevant leadership lessons learned from his personal experience leading his school community through the costliest tornado in U.S. history. And Dr. Huff was extremely inspiring. This uh, previous superintendent touched on the parallels of overcoming monumental events such as the COVID-19 pandemic. And that, I mean, I, I don't know of anybody that wasn't touched by his presentation. During the academy, participants engaged in professional development on a variety of topics, including sessions focused on our new strategic plan. Each participant signed a commitment card and identified a core value to model during the school year. Uh, our division's principals also shared their school improvement plans amongst their peers which was the highlight of the event, along with the lead participants sharing their passion projects with their colleagues. Uh, another event that we had was uh, new teacher orientation just last week. We had 166 new teachers, and they were the, uh, the, have, the 166 have been hired prior to last Monday when we started, and 157 of those were able to attend the event. We are so excited to have these people on the team these team of professionals joining us with York County School Division. In addition to presentations from central office staff, the new teachers also had the opportunity to learn from current YCSD teachers. So we're uh, you know, monopolizing on that expertise. Today and tomorrow, our teachers and staff are participating in division-wide professional development provided by our division's instruction and operations personnel. Content-specific sessions are structured to provide classroom teachers, school counselors, librarians, nurses, and other support staff updates and resources in areas of curriculum and instruction, division programs and initiatives aligned to our strategic plan. We also had our Transportation Academy. The Transportation Academy was held at Tab High School on August 16th for the day. There were 121 people in attendance, which included drivers, assistants, van drivers, and crossing guards. One of the major highlights was the rollout of the strategic plan to, to that group. Also, there was additional emphasis on safety and a number of other transportation and professional growth topics. And I'm sure you're interested to know that of the 121, 108 are bus drivers. And uh, last year at this time, we started with 88. So, uh, and we still have some in the pipeline. So we uh, start in a much better footing than we, we did last year. So we look, be look forward to a better start to the year with transportation. We also had a special education boot camp on July 27th, where we had assistant principals, student services staff, ACCs, and teachers. They came together to prepare for leading special education in their schools. Student services staff facilitated with learning the process of identifying and serving students with disabilities. Training started with the child find process through the special education eligibility process to the development of effective IEPs. Student services team will follow up with new administrators individually to support effective implementation as we support our students with disabilities in every one of our schools. And uh, you heard from Mr. Cuba from the podium today and I, I wanna echo some of what he said I want to thank our custodial staff for their hard work over the summer. This group's been understaffed for a while, and yet they can continue to produce. They take great pride in providing excellent service as they clean and prepare our buildings for our returning students and staff. Their attention to detail is vital to our division, and their commitment is greatly appreciated. And in conclusion, we are one week away. Mm -hmm. uh, we will welcome back returning and new students 
and we are looking forward to a great school year. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Carroll. All right, as a reminder, our next work session will be held here at York Hall on Monday, September 12th at 6 p.m. Have a great week.